Hello. Welcome to another edition of Airway on Demand podcast interviews. I am your host, Dr. William Rosenblatt, Professor of Anesthesiology at Yale University School of Medicine. Our recording studios are at the Smilo Cancer Center at Yale New Haven Hospital. We're going to continue with our series of interviews from the WAM meeting in Dublin. Last month, we spoke to Anil Patel about his transnasal high flow oxygenation. This month, we'll talk to Michael Pedro and Steve Cataldo about a device that they've been working on, the supernova. The supernova is a nasal mask which can be used to pre oxygenate the patient, ventilate the patient and continue oxygenation during the intubation process, and also has a face piece, so it's a two-part mask, which can be put on to give a full face mask ventilation if that's so chosen. We'll certainly keep in mind during this podcast that both Mike and Steve have financial interests in the success of the supernova, but I found them to be engaging and really very sincere about the technique and the device and where they see the potential for this kind of nasal ventilation and oxygenation. So we're here at the WAM meeting to, you know, to congregate and talk to our colleagues and look at new devices out there. And, and one thing that's been very significant in the literature recently is the idea of providing oxygenation especially nasal oxygenation during all phases of the airway management. And you two have come up with a device that provides this, provides oxygenation throughout not only the induction and mass ventilation of the patient, but then during the apneic period, during the intubation, or possibly failed intubation. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're working on? Yeah, so I'd like to start off by sharing the vision that we had. In, in our residency program, we were seeing uh, patients desaturated made us feel nervous, uncomfortable, and that we, we could do better. So we got to the point where we want to know, is it just our institution or is it elsewhere that this is occurring? So let me stop you there for a second. Under what circumstances might you see a patient oxygen desaturate? Sure. So we noticed that our patient's population is getting more morbidly obese. So we were seeing patients, you know, that normally would be eight minutes of an apneic period. We're getting to sometimes less than a minute of some of these morbidly obese patients or patients that have limited physiologic reserve, patients that either have acute, acute pneumonia, acute respiratory failure from, from sepsis, that are, they're just dry, you know, they're, they're expanding so much oxygenation. Uh, patients that undergoing tra even transesial uh, echocardiography where they have very limited reserve because their heart function is poor and we have to in, induce an apneic period that only right now we can apply only supplemental oxygen. So we noticed even outside of the OR that these patients were desaturating very quickly as well. Another big area was advanced endoscopy. You know, patients that maybe septic that are requiring ERCPs. A lot of these patients that normally we should have a longer period of time before they desaturate, they were desaturating a lot faster. Yeah. And even in non-critical settings, even in uh, simple deep sedation cases, um, personal experience being um, total joint replacements under spinal anesthesia with propofol. Um, patients certainly don't want to be awake for their surgical procedure, but we don't need to um, incur a plane of anesthesia that's, that's quote-unquote general. So we give them propofol anesthesia or, or even moderate to deep sedation, and we're finding desaturation events during these just based on upper airway obstruction, hypoventilation, um, both for hypoxemia and hypercarbia. You mentioned periods of uh, apnea of eight minutes or so, you know, and you see desaturation prior to that. Uh, what kind of situations were these? Were just during the deep sedation cases or during, um, you mentioned uh, transesophageal echo, mm -hmm. maybe elective, but also during difficult airway management scenarios? Without a doubt. A Could you, absolutely. Could you describe that? Sure. So one of the biggest things that we noticed, whether it was difficult airways or even emergency intubations outside of the OR, Currently, what we do is we pre oxygenate then we take that oxygen mask off, and we attempt to intubate. A lot of these patients can be unanticipated difficult airways. And what I, I started watching people, and a lot of time, rather than try and re-oxygenate, they would start thinking, okay, what do I need? Try, let me try another blade. Let me try a bougie. Let me try a, a different size endotracheal tracheal tube. And I was counting the minutes, and all of a sudden, five, six minutes went by, 
patient never received any oxygen. Sure, the endotracheal tube might have went in, but six minutes later, while the patient was starting to desaturate, what, had desaturated, and, but the, the, the providers would feel somewhat comfortable because, oh, I can see the cords. Then video laryngoscopy has, has now come in where we can see great views, but we have trouble passing the tube. And again, I noticed that people, that clinicians would, that would continue to try passing the tube because they saw the view, yet no oxygen was being delivered to our patients and they were desaturating. Are some of these situations, I mean, a judgment error was made? These probably should have been handled as difficult intubations from the get-go? Certainly. I think, you know, as we move forward, as, especially as you look towards, you know, private practices and things like that, I think our tendency to avoid things like awake fiber optic and even skill levels of the physicians practicing such procedures um, isn't quite as strong or the physicians don't feel as comfortable doing those procedures, especially by themselves. Um, I, I do truly believe that we do chance it a little more than we should. Um, with that being said, it's not, just, it's not just anesthesia providers that are intubating these patients on the floor. Um, certainly in our institutions, it are, they are into, uh, anesthesia providers, but pulmonary critical care, ER physicians, people who are not trained in awake fiber optic. Um, so we can't expect those people to be intubating these patients under, quote unquote, the safest conditions possible. So before we get into the device that you guys have, have worked on and, and uh, bringing to the operating room, I'm going to ask you a provocative question. So by providing increased um, oxygenation for these patients during an apneic period and uh, showing clinicians that they can probably extend the, the apneic period, are you potentially giving them a, a new level of confidence that they shouldn't have? In other words, taking a patient who's a, a difficult intubation who should have been managed as a, let's say, an awake intubation, mm -hmm. uh, and now because you're now providing more oxygenation, the clinicians mistakenly think, oh, I can go ahead. And this is what we saw with the GlideScope. We saw a lot of patients who really should have been managed with awake intubation, but because clinicians felt so confident in this new fangled device, the GlideScope, yeah, sure. they went ahead and induced sure. anesthesia. Do you have any feelings about that? That's uh, a very good question. I think there, there's two, two ways to go uh, about answering that question. The first is, coming from a, a private practice perspective, unfortunately it is all about the, the bottom line in, in, in turning turnover and getting cases done faster, and there is a lot of that, that pressure. Now, patient care always comes first, so the fact that we're gonna, there's always gonna be that pressure there, I think it helps kind of bridge that gap where we are allowing a little bit more safety because mm -hmm. I'm probably still not going to do an awake fiber optic. I would love to, but I'm going to, it's going to be pretty difficult to do in, in a lot of settings. And I feel like other physicians are probably feeling that same way. Um, so I think it'll help bridge that gap where if you're not going to do it, at least there is some additional level of safety, some additional time period. Now, the, the other thing, I, I think everybody takes intubation the wrong way currently. Right now, it feels like it has to be a rush. And when you start to rush things, that's where more mistakes come. Mm -hmm. So I think being able to have more of a controlled setting, which is, I believe, from my, pers my perspective, I would much rather have a more of a controlled setting so I can think more clearly and make the right decision, as opposed to, okay, now something's wrong, now I'm almost in panic mode, but we're trained not to go in panic mode and try and make those decisions while we're still feeling it. Because even though you can control what you're doing in the operating room, internally we are still feeling that stress. Right. And just to follow up on that, to answer your question further, I think for me the best answer is with great power comes great responsibility. And even though we, you know, innovation gives us the ability to do things on a safer level, to do more advanced procedures, um, at the same time we still have to be treating our patients first. Um, and the safest thing is awake intubation. Certainly our goal was never to replace certain techniques in anesthesia, never to replace the endotracheal tube or the mm -hmm. supraglottic airway, but, but to give a little bit of a safety buffer to those procedures. And interesting enough, we believe the, when we get into the product, one of the main areas where it will help out is actually more of an awake fiber optic mm -hmm. or semi-awake mm -hmm. fiber optic where patients that may be really morbidly obese that you know, we are right now giving some type of sedation because they don't want to be completely awake for it, but they're obstructing, they're becoming, mm -hmm. they're, they're desaturating. Now we can continue to apply a positive nasal airway pressure um, if we're doing oral awake fiber optic. Okay. 
Well, tell me now a little bit about the, the supernova. So the supernova was, des was designed to be a multifunctional anesthesia mask to give the power back to the physician, to the clinician. Um, it is based on the, the, the abilities of nasal ventilation and uh, it's, it was designed solely to master the, the clinical benefits of nasal ventilation. Uh, certainly nasal ventilation has been, has been shown in many instances to be very effective in treating upper airway obstruction, but also in even head-to-head -head studies, um, it's been shown for mask ventilation in apneic patients to be superior in many ways um, than full face mask ventilation, how we originally taught. So by allowing for a more effective or even as effective ventilation technique as full face mass ventilation, now we still have access to the oral cavity, which allows us to use positive pressure ventilation during procedures where we historically could not, such as EGD, ERCP, TEE, even fiber optic bronchoscopy, or dental procedures per se. Um, and on top of that, it allows us to continue to give a high flow of oxygenation, but also even deliver positive pressure through the nose during intubation attempts, where historically we leave our patients apneic without any assistance. So as, as an old guy, tell me, I still don't have the concept of how you can do nasal positive pressure ventilation with an, an open mouth. There's a few different ways to look at that. There's a difference between continuous positive airway pressure and positive pressure ventilation. We cannot provide continuous positive pressure because there will also be a continuous leak out of the mouth. However, by driving past, by using pressure to drive past the tongue, you will now apply a pressure that will go into the trachea, into the lungs. Again, it won't be a continuous pressure. Now, the faster you ventilate, the higher the rate you ventilate, the more uh, positive pressure, the longer the positive pressure will be there over a, an extended period of time. For example, if I give 30 breaths, at five seven meters of water pressure, half of that time will now be at five seven meters of water pressure. The other half, yes, you're right, it will not be continuous. There will be a, a continuous leak out of the mouth. However, one step further, let's go back to what I had said previously, where during the intubation process, it's very rare where somebody is holding a laryngoscope in a patient's mouth up for an extended period of time, say longer than 10 seconds. Where a lot of these desaturations occur is when they don't see. It's what they do next. It's not immediately put an oxygen mask and restart ventilating. It's, oh, can I, let me try another blade. Let me get an, an, another endotracheal tube. Let me get a, a bougie. Well, now, as soon as that tongue goes back down, we regain positive pressure ventilation mm -hmm. and expand the lungs. And it's that time period of five, six minutes that we, we're still thought up and just get the tube in. That's where I think this is going to be the biggest advocate. Is there historical um, data on this? Let's say, was, was sole nasal ventilation ever talked about 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? Did you guys find anything like yeah, that? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. Certainly over the last five to 10 years, mm -hmm. sure. uh, we started thinking about nasal positive pressure ventilation in terms of mask ventilation. Um, 20 decades and decades ago, starting in the 60s and 70s, we looked at nasal CPAP, nasal BiPAP for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. Yes, so positive pressure ventilation was present there. But in terms of mask ventilation in apneic patients mm -hmm. or non-spontaneously breathing patients, um, really it's, it's brand new up in the last five to 10 years only. There have been two studies done at Mass General. Uh, one was by Dr. Liang, the other was by Dr. Otto, where they compared a nasal mask versus a, a full face mask in anesthetized paralyzed patients. And they found that the nasal mask had lower peak airway pressures, about 17 on average, versus the full face mask, which had about 25 centimeters of water pressure on average for the same tidal volumes. Mm -hmm. The nasal mask also had higher flows than, than the full face mask. So indeed, they did actually find it superior to full face mask ventilation, even with a, if there was a leak out of the mouth. And they were able to, when you say tidal volume, they were able to measure volume emanating right. from the respiratory circuit. That's right. No, no, they were not. Okay. They measured tidal volume via plethysmography. Plethysmography. Okay. Okay. So, but it is a, uh, it is a true tidal volume. It's not just. Correct. It's not measured by exhaled gas. It's actually a true tidal volume. By, by changes right. in lung, by changes right. in, in lung, okay. lung and, and certainly the way we teach nasal ventilation, if you're going to mass ventilate someone, we do encourage you to close the mouth manually. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a, it's a little bit of a separate technique on how you hold your mask. Mm -hmm. You know, holding a full face mask has never been an easy task, and certainly it takes many months, if not years, to really truly master, especially one-handed technique. Um, with a nasal mask being so small, 
um, and connecting only to very rigid structures, the maxilla, the zygoma, the nasal bridge, um, downward pressure of the mask is actually very effective in maintaining a seal, whereas downward pressure with a full face mask has historically been a no-no because it pushes the mandible downward, flexes the neck, pushes soft tissue into the upper airway and causes upper airway obstruction. So our technique behind mask holding has drastically changed, and it's a change in culture, no doubt about it. It certainly is a change in culture. Now, now your device actually is a full face mask, which then separates. So, you know, would, would traditionally we would start with a full face mask covering nose and mouth, and then in this particular case, you would divide the mask and they only have the nasal portion during, let's say, the intubation process, do you ever teach just starting out with the nasal part of the mask and then laying yeah, that way? Yeah, absolutely, buddy. Um, our, our mask is designed to be a nasal mask with the possibility of an oral attachment. Okay. All right, so it is designed to be used as a sole anesthesia mask just by a nasal, nasal component. Um, we certainly thought that it was important to add the oral component for different procedures or different clinician um, likes. Um, for example, if I was finishing up um, a nasal endoscopic sinus surgery, I'm certainly going to want access to a full face mask afterwards if I don't have access to the nose. Um, so there's definitely utility in providing a full face mask. Um, and again, like I said earlier, we wanted to give the clinician the ability to, to treat as they saw fit for that particular patient, so we wanted to give them that ability. But Yes, we do use a nasal mask solely for the grand, grand majority of our cases. We pre-oxygenate with a nasal mask, we mask ventilate, and we continue it during the intubation process. And of course, we're talking about uh, total intravenous anesthesia in these cases. Would you use this for inhalation anesthesia? So during induction, of the, uh, during induction, yes, we would. With the full? I would use the nasal mask as well. Okay, just closed mouth? Or? Correct. Now, we have to also remember... Universal precautions, we should be using gloves. And most of us do use gloves when mm -hmm. we manage the airway. Um, if we were to put plastic wrap around somebody's mouth, they're not going to be able to exhale. What we find is when we go to mass ventilate, because it's a different technique, we actually, our hand covers the mouth inherently mm -hmm. now. And the rubber glove acts as a great seal. Now, like he had said, we also have other techniques where we can, which historically hasn't been done. We apply s some small pressure at the submental space here, which allows the tongue to fall back and helps close off the seal. What we've also noticed anecdotally, we've done this now each on over a thousand patients, that the bigger the patients are, the less leak there is, which kind of makes sense. Inherently, they have a lot more soft tissue, a lot more fatty deposits in, in, around their tongue, their retropharynx, that helps close that off yeah. and prevent any leak. Yeah, they basically, they basically occlude their own oral cavity. Another very interesting thought is during advanced endoscopies, our colleagues actually push our tongue back. Mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. put an oral bite block in and actually push okay. the tongue back. Now when they put the scope in, there's actually not that much leak that comes out. So both of us have done uh, general anesthesia with, with just the nasal, nasal mask, mask. with the mouth open. Good. And one last thing is again, because we wear a rubber glove, it's very easy to put your hand right around the scope mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and blo block it off as well. Excellent. It's pretty cool. Well, um, thank you all. Um, look forward to, to seeing the, the mask at uh, the WAM meeting here in, in Dublin. And uh, thank you for taking your time to, to speak to us today at AODPI. And best of luck. Thank you thank very you, much. Dr. It was our pleasure. It was a pleasure. That concludes this episode of Airway on Demand podcast interviews. I'm your host, William Rosenblatt, Professor of Anesthesiology and Surgery at Yale University School of Medicine, and I thank you for joining us. I look forward to your comments, which you can submit either via the Airway on Demand website or through the Society for Airway Management website. And if you have suggestions for further podcasts, I'd be delighted to entertain those. I also hope to see you at upcoming meetings of the Society for Airway Management. The next meeting will be in Atlanta, Georgia, September 16th through 18th, 2016. And this meeting is being organized and chaired by our good friend, Felipe Urdaneta. Once again, this is your host, Dr. William Rosenblatt, signing off and wishing you smooth airways.